A very good morning to all. Uh, dear guests, I hope you can hear me clearly. Dear guest speakers, uh, network and committee members, and all the participants of this webinar, I'm glad to have you all at our meeting on preventing and combating violence against women in sport, hosted by the Parliamentary Network, Women Free from Violence. I would also like to make a content warning. The webinar will include a testimony and uh, mention sensitive topics such as sexual abuse. Therefore, please uh, have that in mind. Mind you, you have uh, if you have not noticed yet, you can watch and listen to the webinar in French or English using the language selector at the bottom left of the screen. Without wasting much of our time, uh, I will immediately give the floor to Ms. Zita Gurmai, the chairperson of the Parliamentary Network women free from violence and uh, the general rapporteur on violence against women for an introduction to our webinar. Zita, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, greetings from the Hungarian National Assembly. And of course, uh, it's a great privilege uh, to see you and, and send you a virtual little heart because this is a very, very difficult time for all of us, and I really hope that your families are properly well. And special thanks for our excellent secretariat to do all the preparation for, for, for this morning session. Of course, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this seminar organized by the Parliamentary Network on uh, Violence and the Committee on Equality and, of course, uh, Non-Discrimination. Uh, we have had already several webinars uh, which have been broadcast live on the Facebook page on the network. Uh, the first one focused on violence against women and COVID-19. The second on challenges to sexual and reproductive health and rights in the time of pandemic. And the third on the gender dimension of foreign policy. Today we will dive into the crucial topic of violence against women in sport and I'm really happy to greet the rapporteur and we will discuss the possible initiatives and measures to be taken to prevent and to combat uh, this violence. There are still many challenges to tackle on the way to gender equality in the world of sports. Parliamentarians from the Assembly, other interested parties, international counterparts and the general public will have the possibility to network and exchange on this issue by asking questions to our excellent panelists. Such online events provide an important contribution to the preparation of reports by assembly reporters. The interventions and subsequent discussions we feed into the work of our uh, moderator, Mr. Kilian Munyama, who is preparing the report, as I already mentioned, on the fight for a level playing field ending discrimination against women in the world of sports. While several European countries enter a new phase of lockdowns and restrictions to face the second wave of the coronavirus pandemic, the Assembly is more than ever a place of dialogue, and I believe this is super important nowadays. Since March 2020, it has been adopted its working formats with the use of new technologies and the organization of virtual meetings and online events such as this webinar. In the face of these unprecedented circumstances, the members of the Assembly have strived to keep promoting its fundamental values through adaptation and innovation. What is more, most reports now include a new dimension addressing the effect of the pandemic on human rights, equality, and non-discrimination. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic 
has given a sense of urgency to tackle pitfalls in inclusion, equality, and to combat violence against women. It has been established that the pandemic has a very serious impact on existing inequalities, making them both more visible and aggravating them, including in sport. Our webinar today focuses on preventing and combating violence against women in sport. It could also be relevant to explore at the future stage the impact of COVID-19 on women's participation and status in sport, and I kindly ask our dear rapporteur to do the utmost for that. We look forward to hearing on how policy relating to the prevention of violence in the world of sport have taken this new context into account or will doing so. As General Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Coordinator of the Network uh, Women Free from Violence, I want to recall that violence against women is a societal scourge and that all necessary means would be implemented to ensure that all women are safe from fear and from violence. To this end, the network is actively campaigning for the ratification and effectiveness of Istanbul Convention, implementation of the Istanbul Convention, which is considered by many as the gold standard in the fight against violence against women. Through the activities of the network, we offer national parliaments the possibility to build on existing good practices and launch new initiatives uh, to tackle violence against uh, women. The work of our members demonstrates their real commitment to keep the issue high in the political agenda. I look forward to the discussion of today's webinar and to the recommendation that will be put forward to prevent and combat violence against women in sport. I am sure that those inputs will provide valuable information for the work of the Assembly and I really encourage its members to go further and stronger in the efforts to the, to the to end of violence against women. I really wish you a fruitful webinar and I just would like to send you another little heart to show how important this event is and I really would like to wish you take care for all the families and loved ones and again thanks for the excellent preparation and good luck for the rapporteur. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Zitter, for your excellent uh, introduction. Uh, we look forward to a strong cooperation with you and the network during your mandate in, the, in every future activity. Uh, this is a challenging time for the, with the COVID-19, as Zita has just mentioned, affecting every aspect of our lives. And I'm afraid to say that this challenging period is not just a healthy issue. It is a, a profound shock to our societies and uh, economies. And uh, women are at the heart of our care. Uh, I'd also like to admit that I'm deeply saddened by the situation of uh, my country, Poland, on the way women's rights are being handled by the present government a topic for a separate report indeed. However, I'm glad to see all of you here and uh, to know that the committee and the network remain active, uh, relevant and present. As uh, some of you might know, I'm currently preparing, and also Zita has mentioned it, uh, preparing a report on the fight for a level playing field, ending discrimination against women in the world of sport for the committee of on equality and non-discrimination of the parliamentary assembly of the council of europe this webinar will provide a great contribution to my work and i look forward to exchanging views with our guests today we have the pleasure of uh, uh, having a diverse uh, panel with athletes uh, representatives of sports federations international organizations, academia, and a documentary maker. Before asking uh, questions to all the uh, panelists, uh, let me begin by introducing each and 
every one of the six distinguished panelists on board with us. <clears throat> First of all, uh, mm, I would uh, say that we have with us uh, Sarah Abitbo, who is a French figure skater with an impressive career. We would like to thank you for taking your time to be with us and sharing your experience and uh, recommendations. Uh, you wrote a book, Un si long silence, such a long silence, uh, which is a testimony of your experience. You have been very present in the media when your book has, uh, was released at the beginning of the year, which contributed to raising awareness on the urgent need to prevent and combat violence against women in sport. Action has uh, been taken by the French Minister of Sports following your testimony and you have been cooperating with the authorities to outline urgent measures and actions to be taken. Your courage has actually helped many women and girls to break the silence. I will give you the floor shortly to answer the first questions. The second speaker is Dagmar Schumacher. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We have a, a long-standing cooperation with UN Women as we participate in events and uh, build on each other's titanic work. UN Women has uh, done so much on empowering women and girls through sport and led campaigns to prevent violence against women in sport. Your presence, presentation of UN Women's of priorities and uh, recommendations will be of interest to all of us today. Third, I would like to I have the privilege to introduce uh, Mr. Pierre Emmanuel Luna Darinac who is a journalist and has actually prepared an investigative documentary uh, broadcast in more than uh, 15 countries so far. The documentary is called Endgame Breaking the Silence and it was shown as an example of the channel Arter uh, leading to debates on the question, important press coverage and calls for actions. Fourth, I would like to introduce, uh, the, or rather warmly welcome, Ms. Uh, Nadezda Connor, uh, who is the Vice President of Women's Sport International. Uh, you are a well-known well <coughs> coach of gymnastics and international Georgian team gymnastics and uh, were appointed in 1970, 19, sorry, 1997 as the uh, first chairperson of the Women and Sport Committee of the Czech Olympic Committee from uh, 2001 to 2004. You have been the first elected woman as member of the board of uh, the Czech Olympic Committee. Since 2016, you have uh, been a member of the International Olympic Committee virtual uh, task force preventing harassment and abuse in sport. You're very much welcome to be with us today. First, I would like to introduce uh, Beatrice Barbrooks. Uh, welcome as well. You are here to share your recommendations as academic and athlete, professional handball player, you are also a sociologist, sociologist, is all right, and the first woman to coach a professional male team. You are now a professor at the University of uh, Paris uh, Créateur. You published your research on sexism in uh, sport in 2016. We are glad to, uh, that you, are, you found time to be with us today. Last but not the least, so we have Miss Joyce Cook, who has been serving as FIFA's Chief Member Association's Office since November 2016 at the helm of the implementation of the FIFA Forward Program 
for football development. You have also been appointed FIFA's Chief Social Responsibility and Education Officer and Secretary General of the FIFA Foundation. Thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to your contribution. The webinar will be organized with uh, two rounds of questions uh, to our panelists, uh, followed by questions from the members of the network and the Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination directly on the CUDA platform. I would uh, like to remind you all that uh, you will have the request you will have to request the floor uh, so as to be able to ask your question and appear on the screen. I would ask uh, speakers also that they have the floor to turn their language and uh, menu at the bottom left of the screen to flow to ensure the quality of the, of the sound transmission. Unfortunately, we don't have the possibility of hosting everyone on KUDO, but we uh, would nevertheless like to open the discussion as well uh, to external participants who are following us, notably on the Facebook page of the network. It will be possible to ask questions by making comments on the page of the event where you, we will also share background information. Many thanks to all of you for being with us today. In case you tweet about the webinar, we would uh, be very grateful if you could tag on or mention the Twitter account at PES-Equality uh, uh, so that we all we all see your tweets. <clears throat> Let's move on to our questions. Uh, each panelist has about five minutes to answer each question. I will be uh, the happiest person around if you stuck to the time limits. Uh, my first question goes to Sarah mm, Abitbol, the figure skater. Sarah, as a figure skating champion, you were sexually uh, abused at a very young age, between 15 and 17. Your coach, who you trusted, was the perpetrator of this violence. In your book, In si Long Silence, silence such a long silence, uh, published at the beginning of the year, you speak out to denounce this violence and break the silence. Could you tell us about your story? What made you break this code of silence surrounding violence against women in the field of sport? Sarah, the floor is yours. Yes, how do you break the silence? I was ashamed. I felt guilty before breaking the silence. But I had to. I had to break the silence in order to uh, save the other girls and women who were also victims of this violence. And I heard that my aggressor was still doing this. He still had his job, and I couldn't stand that. I knew he was a danger. I knew he had children around, teenagers around, in the field of skating, and I, I thought, you have to speak out. You have to break the rule of silence in order to save those other victims of his aggression. That is what moved me. What pushed me violently that's how I was able to save other victims. And I thought, I have to write a book. I have to be strong. It's up to me to save future victims from his aggressions. I also decided I would speak out after the 
Me Too movement. The Me Too movement was actually very difficult for me. But now I think I am free, free through speech, by speaking. We are in the year 2020. We should speak up freely. That is also what helped me, what helped me to write my book, which is about the truth. It's true that I did suffer enormously, but today I feel much lighter. Many victims are writing to me and they say, thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks to you, I was able to speak to my children. I was able to speak to my husband. I was able to speak to my mom. And that is thanks to you. It's after reading your book. I didn't feel guilty anymore afterwards. Finally, I have managed to speak out. There are also many federations who were the object of uh, investigations after I spoke out. Uh, the Horse Riding Federation, the Roller Skate Federation. There were inquiries. Many victims started invest asked for investigations to be launched against their coaches. And they told me it was thanks to me, thanks to my being a witness in my book. So. When I read that, when I hear that, I think that's a victory. So that's the gold medal I never got. It's a victory indeed. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We command your courage, which allows discussing this important topic. Uh, I would like to express that accompanying survivors when they tell the story and preventing the revictimization is uh, of utmost importance. It is crucial to have uh, a survivor-centered approach in policies on preventing and uh, combating violence against women, as recommended by the Istanbul Convention. Your powerful testimony contributes to raising awareness, and we are grateful to you with uh, and have you with us today. Yes, now I would like to ask a question to Madame Dagmar Schumacher, the director of Brussels office, UN Women. UN Women has been engaged with many years in empowering women through a sport. Uh, could you tell us, could you tell us uh, more about it? Sports for Equality Initiative and uh, specific actions to prevent and combat discrimination and violence against women in, in sport. Uh, Dagmar, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair, and also many thanks for organizing this important seminar. I also want to thank Sarah for the testimony she just shared with us, and I um, truly believe her story has to be heard by many um, because it will inspire many, and um, I can commit already now uh, from the UN Women's side that we would be happy to also um, share a tweet on the book so people, people know about it even more widely. With regard to the question you just asked me, um, UN Women worked closely with the International Olympic Committee to develop the Sport for Generation Equality Principles. Led by UN Women, the Sport for Generation Equality Initiative is an invitation to the sports ecosystem to be part of a powerful multi-stakeholder coalition to make gender equality a lived reality for all. Six Sport for Gender Equality principles are derived from the Beijing Platform of Action, which celebrates, as probably all of you know, its 25th anniversary this year. 
consisting of governments, United Nations organizations, Sport for Development and Peace organizations, civil society, sport federations, event organizers, leagues, teams, brands, marketers, medias, and sport influencers. It multiplies the impact for gender equality and women and girls empowerment by enabling learning from one another and accelerating efforts to first, promote women's leadership and gender equality in governance models. Second, prevent and respond to gender-based violence. Third, undertake to close the gap in investment in women's sports and promote equal economic opportunities for women and girls. Fourth, promote women's equal participation and bias-free representation in media. And last but not least, provide equal opportunities for girls in sports, physical activity, and physical education. Sports for Generation Equality Initiative members are invited to make specific commitments aligned under a shared vision, a common set of principles, and design action plans to accomplish them. They also commit to monitor and report progress. The list of organizations that have signed on is growing and includes the International Olympic Committee, Professional Squash Association, World Sailing Federation, Cricket Australia, Male Champions of Change in Sport, Ibero-American Sports Council, Eurovision Sports, among many others. One of the principles is to eliminate violence against women and girls in and through sport, taking a holistic approach that starts with women leadership to bring these issues to the table, to sp support development, and most importantly, implementation of policies and procedures to address violence against women and girls, to increase investment in these, to challenge the negative stereotypes that drive them, uh, violence against women and girls through the media and use of role models, and to empower girls through access to sport combined with life skills, to build a new generation of change agents who recognize violence against women and girls and know how to seek assistance. Sport for Generation Equality is based on a theory of change that posits that changes in the elite sport world influence culture and set examples while creating more opportunities for girls through sport and community level access to sport that drives generational change through direct empowerment. We need both working together as they are mutually reinforcing. In recent years, Sport has demonstrated its enormous capacity to propel women and girls' empowerment. It mobilizes the global community and speaks to youth. It unites across national barriers and cultural differences. It is a powerful tool to convey important messages in a positive and celebratory environment, often to mass audiences. In addition, it teaches women and girls the values of teamwork self-reliance and resilience has the multiplier effect on their health, education and leadership development, contributes to self-esteem, builds social connections and challenges harmful gender norms. We have seen clear results of the positive impact on girls through our program, One Win Leads to Another, which is a legacy of the Rio Olympics in partnership with the IOC. So I hope many of you who are listening today and many others will join these principles on generation equality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dagmara. Dagmara, uh, for the very inciting information that you've put forward. UN Women is actually indeed very active on this topic and we are all we all look forward to further cooperation including uh that at the generation uh equality forum uh, that will take place next year uh at the very beginning of the uh, the first half of 2021 uh we know that the dates will have to be announced 
so we're looking forward to that uh, forum. Uh, let me now come to Pierre, Emmanuel, Lunier, Darunac, uh, the director of the documentary Violent Sexuals, Violence Sexual uh, Dans le Sport, L'Inquit, uh, Arte. You produced an uh, edifying documentary actually for Arte on sexual violence in sport. Uh, why did you decide to deal with this subject as a journalist? Uh, did you encounter any difficulties in the making of the film, be it in obtaining testimonies, uh, accompanying the victims, or uh, engaging with the federations? Pierre, Emmanuel, the floor is yours. We would like to ask Mr. Luno Dorignac to ask for the floor. Do you hear me and see me now? Yes, great. Awesome. I do not hear you. Well, I don't know why. Anyway. All right, so first question, why? It turns out that, um, well, I'm uh, a journalist for like 20 years now. I was part of a uh, TV team, investigation team in 2008, and uh, I read a book from a former tennis woman, French tennis woman called Isabelle de Monjou, and um, she told her story and analyzed the a little bit the roots of the of her story, and I realized that there were their roots of a much broader phenomenon. And the mechanism that she underlined were mechanisms that could be found very easily in other sports and other countries. So therefore, I um, led a short investigation in 2008, and it turns out that, uh, uh, that I did investigate on in 2008 on the perpetrator of the abuse of Sarah Abidbol, even though I had to not tell his name for judiciary reasons. So, but I did not know for her, of course. Um, uh, that's a little story inside the whole story. So, and uh, so 10 years later, uh, actually in 2016, after the Nassar story in the United States, and the, the Woodward case, uh, the article of, uh, about Andy Woodward uh, in The Guardian, in the, Guardian <clears throat> in the UK, I told myself this is a good moment to do a broader investigation in the whole world and to, to try to say that this is a much broader issue. Um, so this is what I did, and thanks again to Arte and all the countries and TV channels who, uh, which are now uh, uh, deciding to, to follow me on this and, and broadcasting this work. And um, so you asked me if I uh, encounter some difficulties. I encountered many. Um, uh, very simply, um, of course, um, much of, of sports federations are extremely not at ease with this issue. And I think that they are still... Uh, in spite of some moments of communication where everybody says, oh my God, this is terrible, we're doing everything we can and everything, I think it's very hard for them to admit the, how, how this problem is, it could affect them. And to realize, because this is, I think, my main uh, thesis, that it is not only an issue, it, it's not mine, it's also the one of many academic experts that, that I quote and, and, and that you're, you're, you're sure, of course, very aware uh, of, but it's also the, the issue that it's sports itself can generate uh, acts of this kind. So it is an issue of pedophilia when I was talking about the issue of violence on children. Uh, of course, here we're talking about violence on women, but I was more focused on violence on children, whether they were women or boys. We can be more specific later in the, in the debate. 
But um, so it is hard for them to, to admit this. Um, so it was hard to gather information. They struggled back at me. They, they still are since I'm now uh, uh, making a, a book. I'm working for like uh, seven months on, on a book on this topic to go a little deeper in the phenomenon and, and try to bring some more, um, not necessarily stories, but more explanations. And um, So difficulties, yes, of this kind. Difficulties also sometimes with, uh, with athletes and victims themselves. Um, asking them to, to talk is an enormous, tremendous effort, and that has to be... Uh, respected because they go through, they relieve what they went through, and sometimes it's just pure hell. So it, you, I think it it takes a lot of efforts and attention to be very careful and not ask them things that you're not going to use because it's it's really unfair. Um, apart from that, I think we are going through an extremely important moment in Europe, in the whole world, in France, thanks to the work of Sarah and congratulations to her courage again. Uh, and, uh, but um, apart from the United States, from with the Nassar case, the UK with the Woodward case, and what happened in football, and what's going on in football now, and gymnastic now, and what, what's going on now in France, I think this is a broader phenomenon. The whole world is now realizing that uh, uh, sexual violence in sport is an issue that, had, that has to be tackled. And I'm extremely happy um, to try to bring my little stone into this uh, into this uh, moment of awareness. Uh, thank you very much, Pierre Emmanuel. Um, at this point in time, actually, I recommend all participants to watch uh, your documentary. Uh, investigative journalism is actually essential to raise awareness uh, among the public, uh, uh, the general public. Uh, there is a need actually to take into account the possible risks uh, for survivors as well as uh, fully respecting um, the dignity of uh, and privacy if it is a subject to their request as well. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, Pierre Emmanuel. <coughs> now, uh, let me uh, turn to Nadezda Knorr, uh, the Vice President of Women's Sport International. Uh, thanks to the international profile of your uh, organization's members, you actually benefit from a comp comprehensive view of their uh, issue of violence against women in sport. Um, now does the, can you tell us more about the advocacy uh, actions undertaken by your organization and uh, how have these initiatives been actually received by their interlocutors? Nadezda, you have, uh, uh, the floor is yours. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm very happy to. Uh, get the possibility to speak here in the name of uh, the Men's Sport International. And going to your question, um, the Men's Sport International, just after the foundation, which was in 1994, established a task force on sexual harassment and abuse in sport, uh, which was chaired by the Black and Rich. And uh, there was no other organization at this time uh, focused on these issues in connection to sport. And the task force had a brochure made, uh, which uh, the following content. 
what are sexual uh, harassment and abuse and who is at risk. And what should be done to help prevent sexual harassment and abuse in sport. A uh, few years later, in 2003, Women's Sport International also made a position statement on sexual harassment and abuse of girls and women in sport. And this position statement ended with recommendations for minimally, minimizing sorry, the risk of sexual exploitation in sports. Um, for example, encourage open debate about sexual harassment, homophobia, and exploitation of women and men in sport, and so on. And I just shorten it because I want to keep my five minutes worded. Um, the position statement has been updated three times, uh, latest in 2018, and the content has shifted from focusing only on sexual harassment and abuse to also include psychological, physical abuse, and neglect. And the use of the term has also changed to use non-accidental violence as an umbrella concept. These two brochures are spread internationally and the content was based on research since some of the members of the task force were leaded in researching also. Uh, Women in Sport Task Force, the members of this force also do speeches, seminars uh, at different symposia on international congresses and meetings. Uh, in sport medicine, sports sociology, psychology, and also spread the brochures at these conferences. Um, some of members of the sexual harassment task force have given also advices to some sport federations, uh, national Olympic committees, and international sport federations. Members of the sexual harassment task force contributed to IOC Medical Commission and the expert panel which produced a consensus statement on sexual harassment and abuse in sport and it was in 2007 and then later on in 2016. And they have also contributed to IOC toolkit for international federations and national Olympic committees. Uh, with the with the content of sympathy, at least from harassment and abuse in sport. So I think that's it for for now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Nadez Der, uh, for sharing with us. Uh, these inspiring initiatives that you have undertaken. Uh, they give food for thought for the future work on my report and uh, I will be in touch to get some additional information uh, on the matter. Yes, uh, I would now uh, have a question to Beatrice Barbus the lecturer at Paris Est, uh, Créteil University, Secretary General of the French Handball Federation. You have uh, analyzed the issue of sexism and of course violence against women in sport uh, from uh, both an academic and uh, of course field perspective. According to your work, what are the main mechanisms that uh, can lead to such violence. Yes, Beatrice, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning. Can everybody hear me? I would just like to specify that I am uh, Secretary General of uh, 
the French Handball Federation, but I haven't been a coach in a club, but uh, chairperson, the president. Now, in the book Sexism on Sport, I explained, in fact, that all of this violence can only occur in a context which is conducive to this. And the context is the following. Sport, first and foremost, was uh, conceived by men. And in uh, social historical terms, it's primarily uh, masculine. So men devised a sport, its organization, its culture, in accordance with the requirements of their gender, the male gender, based on competition, domination, physical strength, mental strength. And hence, this is an environment where domination is, in fact, institutionalized. Sport and sports organizations are machines which are there to uh, class, um, uh, measure, compare performances, and uh, uh, they uh, analyze the strength of people, etc. And therefore, we find ourselves in a context where, quite logically, women are uh, dominated symbolically. And here I refer to the work uh, carried out by Philippe Lyotard and Frédéric Bayette. So in quantitative terms, women are also in a minority. And the sociologist speaks about uh, uh, the house of men when she speaks about sports. So we find ourselves in a universe where we can observe uh, in quantitative terms on a daily basis that sexism is institutionalized. And how can we see this? In fact, almost systematically, there is this tendency to make women inferior, whether they are um, leaders, coaches, sports women, and they're often given uh, subordinate roles. There are very few uh, presidents, vice presidents, a few trainers or coaches, and very often their roles are simply confined to, in fact, doing secretarial work, drafting reports, catering, dealing with issues such as feminization, social ethical issues, etc. So in fact, major issues, they are told, are not in their domain, and they're, in fact, uh, evolving in a primarily male world. And so violence, in fact, uh, can be seen on a permanent basis. And the higher up you get in the, on the ladder of performance, the more you can see that there is violence in terms of the language used, the tone used, although, of course, you are far removed from the athlete, from the sports person. But even when you're close to the person, the tone isn't the same as in other sectors of human activities. And in terms of the language, the vocabulary that is used, it's a vocabulary that's very harsh um, with a lot of insults, a physical violence as well. The, the field of sport is uh, the uh, area where you, uh, in fact, uh, exalt uh, pain uh, and effort. Uh, athletes, when they're not suffering, have the feeling that they haven't, in fact, tried hard enough, both in physical and mental terms. So there's this physical violence, which can be seen, but also mental and psychological, which can be seen inter alia in the way people are trained. And besides, in uh, Sarah Bigwog's uh, book, she describes it very well. And last week in France, there were uh, denouncements of uh, ill treatment into alia in judo. So we can see that there are many manifestations of violence and we can encounter them everywhere. And in this kind of context, I'd like to say that the mechanisms which are very well described by Sarah in her book, in such a context, the uh, manifestations of uh, uh, ill treatment uh, can be seen, as can be seen, for example, um, uh, in this area and regarding both girls and boys. First of all, there's control by men over women in general. And lastly, uh, the control of the people in authority on the uh, subordinates, the authority d represented by a coach or uh, a director is very important. And uh, these mechanisms are all the stronger in as much as they go hand in hand with this desire to succeed, both on the part of the athlete, because that's their dreams, 
the dream as well of the parents who very often have made all sorts of sacrifices to allow their children to uh, compete at a high level and uh, the desire on the part of the sports organization which wishes uh, to obtain successes. Success is also uh, targeted by the coaches. They want to be seen as the ones who trained the, the star. So you can see that there's this environment of trust which is often created between the athletes, the coaches and the uh, parents which in turn can be conducive to violence. And lastly, as has been showed very clearly by Pierre-Emmanuel Dorignac in his documentary, indeed I do recommend to all that you to, to see this, there are organizational mechanisms um, in this male world these organizational mechanisms which as has been said are difficult to admit and in sports institutions where you want to keep a low profile uh, for reasons of renown and image and reputation to forget that after all we're in a very competitive uh, environment and therefore we don't want to, uh, as I say to, to make ripples and everybody knows one another so it's difficult to uh, denounce somebody that you've known for 20 years, 30 years, or even 10 years. So in short, these phenomena of violence uh, in reality, and I see this every day in the field, are underestimated, underestimated as regards their scope. We never realized that there was so much of this uh, violence, that it was so widespread, and the human fallout, the human consequences, because the victims, until now at least, were not sufficiently heard or listened to. So there's this blindness which is shared by all all of the stakeholders, all the people involved. So that's what I wanted to say, and this is what we see on the basis of many investigations, both uh, anthropological and sociological in nature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beatrice, for your contribution, for your insights on this complicated matter violence against women finds its origin in profound gender inequality that we have. Uh, this is why we need to act at different levels as, uh, uh, so as to prevent and combat this violence that we are encountering. Thank you so much again for your views. Uh, I also have a, a question actually for you, Joyce. Cook, uh, CBE's OBE, uh, Chief Social Responsibility and Education Officer, uh, Fédération Internationale de Football Association, uh, FIFA, who has been actually developing the specific tools to prevent abuse and, uh, of course, violence in sport, including against women. Could you present? these and uh, the future actions foreseen, including uh, FIFA's recent call for new multi-sports, multi-government and uh, agency entity to assist actually sports in undertaking survivor-centered case management of abuse cases in sports. Joyce? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just to check you can hear me okay. We can hear you. Super. Thank you very much for the opportunity and the invitation today. We, we greatly appreciate that and, and uh, to be part of such an esteemed panel of experts as well um, is a real privilege. And, you know, like the other panelists, I, I really want to start by thanking Sarah, recognizing Sarah. I haven't met Sarah before, but for her very brave testimony and uh, uh, the words she has spoken um, and her upcoming book. Um, you know, I, 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 I think what resonated most for me in, in, in Sarah's uh, address to us this morning is her feeling that she felt she had to save other victims. And, and I guess for me um, and for FIFA, that's the starting point I'd like to pick up in the first element. And then I don't know if you want me to speak about our call for the new entity now or in the next part of the session. But I, one of the key issues we've recognized at FIFA, and, and I'd like to start by saying we understood in 2018 
that we were late to the table. I think most sports, if they're honest, would say the same. And that we hadn't recognized the issues that uh, were occurring in our sport and indeed in, in all sports, let's face it, and indeed in the wider world. And so our key priority was to establish, establish a, a team of experts. We have three uh, very um, experienced persons in uh, this area and particularly in safeguarding and preventative measures. And I'd like to steal my first five minutes to really talk about the preventative measures because for sports and indeed every sector, we have to work very earnestly in that regard if we're going to ensure our sports are safe and welcoming for our young people, for women, for vulnerable adults going forward. And it, this can't be underestimated. So we set about um, an expert working group, indeed with experts from the Council of Europe, from UNICEF, from uh, some of our member associations, in particular the Scottish FA, of course, Operation Hydrant and the non-recent cases that came to light in the UK, and other experts um, in, in that group as well. And our first question, my first question to them was, what do we need to do as FIFA? What do we need to do as the international governing body of football to address this issue in the short term, in the medium term, but mostly for the long term? So we have established a, a toolkit uh, um, that's been written together with expert, a great deal of expertise for our 211 member associations on preventative measures, policies, risk assessments, and so on. Now, of course, a toolkit is only as good as its implementation. So in addition, and with the backing of our statutes, our ethics codes, our regulations, our embedding of obligations into our development funding program, we have gone about building this capacity. And what we've realized, so we started with a questionnaire to our 211 members, is this is an area that in sports, and indeed in the wider sector, there is a great deal of work to do and we all have to face this, sports, governments, um, all of the agencies we work with. We, we can only do this together. Um, as FIFA, we are completely and utterly committed to this. Our president made an absolute pledge and, and, and leads us in, in our commitment to this area. So we are doing a number of things. We are um, unfortunately, COVID, like all of us, has had an impact and we had hoped to be um, having in-person workshops, but we're having uh, webinars, firstly with the leaders of each of our member associations, because we understand if the presidents, the secretary generals, the senior leadership in our members are not understanding this issue and not making an obligation from the very top to undertake the commitment to put strong preventative measures in place, then we will be doomed to fail. And those are going very well. We're, we're rolling those out regionally at the moment and going to great lengths to explain to everybody the importance of preventative safeguarding measures and understanding that it's everybody's job, not only the focal point or the safeguarding officer. We have worked on a series of train the trainer workshops together with UNICEF and a few other expert entities. We are also um, launching with the Open University probably very early in the new year, um, late this year, early new year, a new safeguarding in sports diploma. And that's uh, um, the first of its kind, not only in sports, but indeed in any sector. I mean, we were shocked to learn this, but it's a reality. So it will be the first of its kind to begin to formalize the role of safeguarding officers in sports and indeed in any sector. Um, we, we understand the importance of, of that program. We're going to ensure that everybody in football is encouraged to undertake course one, which is essentials in safeguarding in sports. And indeed, we are um, writing to our member associations to assign at least one person in each member association to undertake that course. But the, I, I guess what I'm trying to present here is we have to embed preventative measures if we are seriously going to eradicate this from our sports. We're very pleased to join UN Women um, in Generation Equality and to, to play our part as football. I think the other elements I would like to highlight is we're also working with our 
colleagues in the professional game to look at ways that we can ensure that measures are embedded, for example, in agents, particularly agents that are working with minors, that we make very strict regulations on their obligation and need for proper safeguarding training. Um, in addition, we're looking and advising on club licensing because although clubs are not our direct responsibility and we're really pleased to see some of the confederations already starting to make this an obligation to play in their tournaments for the football clubs to play in their tournaments. But we have a long way to go. It's very clear we have a long way to go. And I, I don't know whether you would like me to pick up on our call for the new entity now and how we're managing cases of abuse reported to us at FIFA or whether you prefer I pick that up in the next session or the right next round thank you so much thank you so much Joyce for uh, the very important comments that you've put forward and uh, also the fact that FIFA is indeed very active on this issue uh, which we are discussing about today um, these amongst others of course uh, we support your call and uh, wish you success in this new endeavor uh, we look forward to hearing about uh, the developments in the near future. Thank so you. I'm very happy to talk about that today. I just don't know whether you want me to talk now or in the next round of questions. In the next round of questions. Ah, uh, super. Right. Thank right. you. Right. Thank you. Perfect. Thank okay. you. So thank you all for your answers and the valuable inputs, which give us uh, a lot to reflect on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will have a second round of questions. Uh, to our panelists uh, before opening uh, the floor to our members and participants. Please uh, um, be patient and uh, let's have the second round of, uh, of, uh, of questions and after that I'll open it to the, to the rest of the participants, okay? So <clears throat> my second question uh, to um, uh, Sarah is uh, the what recommendations would you make to sports federations, uh, authorities, parliamentarians like us, uh, as well as parents, uh, in order to prevent and actually fight uh, more effectively violence against women in the field of sport? Sarah, the floor is yours. <clears throat> I'm a mum, my daughter is nine years old. It's still difficult for me to talk to her about what I had to go through. I already explained to her that her body belongs to her. And for her intimate parts, I call it your little treasure. And I tell her nobody is allowed to touch your little treasure but I have not had the courage yet to tell her about what happened to me. But I think it's time for me to tell her because it's very important that she understand what it is I'm fighting for now, why it is that every day I'm fighting for this. So I am going to talk to her about it in a couple of weeks' time. Of course, I'll have to use the right words. I have to adapt my uh, discourse because she's very young, but she's old enough to understand what happened to me and to understand what it is uh, I'm fighting for today. What do I recommend to parents? I think it's important for them to tell their children from the age of five or six on at the latest, your body is yours. No adult is allowed to touch your body. I think that's what I would recommend parents. Sometimes you don't even think about it. Maybe it's a taboo subject. You don't want to talk about the topic. And why would it happen to us? It, it's ha what happens to others. But unfortunately, no, it does happen to anybody. I'm the proof of it, and that's why I'm talking about it today. So parents should talk to their children when they're young. It's important. It's very important. Concerning sports federations and measures that ought to be taken at that level, codes of ethics are being adopted in some federations. After my book, 
The ministry has done all it could for this not to happen again. But unfortunately, of course, zero risk does not exist. However, I do believe that sports federations are aware of what might be going on or what can happen. And the ministry has set up a code, a code of ethics. And for those who work in clubs, it's most important. It's crucial to have a code of ethics. It's entitled Code of Honorability. I think, for instance, if back then, at the time, anybody in the club had said anything about it, if another victim had explained what she'd undergone, or if a social worker had come talk to us, had come to tell us, children, teenagers, what it is the coach is allowed to do and what it is he isn't allowed to do. Perhaps, I'm not saying definitely, but perhaps at least, I could have uh, spoken out, uh, freed myself through speech and said, well, something's going on and I don't think it's normal. So I think that hearing other victims in clubs is most useful. That's what I want to implement. Hearing others who've gone through this can help prevent and can help teenagers speak up, speak out, and get rid of this uh, very heavy burden, this not normal thing which happened to her. So I think it's up to the associations to do that. I'm not member of an association, technically speaking, but I do work with many associations, including on amnesia, uh, uh, colosse au pied d'argile, giant with uh, feet of, uh, uh, with fragile feet, is in, where I speak out and see, try to see if any others in the group, if any of the teenagers seem to react in such a way that you can suppose something might have happened. And you also have to ask, what is it the coach actually does with you? Because the coach isn't just a coach. He's a master. He's a model. Everything the coach says to do, you do it artistically, technically. So it's uh, not only physical preparation. The coach is the man you can count on. And it's also the person you speak to. So he plays a major role. And somebody else has to tell you what it is. And he can't do. He shouldn't do. That's what should be taught to teenagers in the sports clubs, in the sports federations. And why not in schools as well? I'm ready to go to schools and uh, continue that fight, continue this uh, combat in order for this not to happen again. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your contribution on the ways actually to prevent and fight more effectively violence against women in the field of sport. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Yes, we're going to move on to Dagmar. Um, Dagmar, uh, sports federations actually are key actors in their fight against violence of course, against women. Uh, what would you be, what would be your actually three principal recommendations to them to step up their fight against violence and uh, better protect victims? Dagmara, the floor is for yours. Yeah, I think now we go. Okay, thanks very much. Yes, I mean, we indeed work closely with both the IOC and FIFA, as well as partners like the Center for Sports and Human Rights, who are advocating for more actions on this front. And um, UN Women really wants to commend both the IOC and FIFA for having developed strong safeguarding protocols and now for taking actions to roll out um, 
to, to roll them out to their respective organizations. Um, and, and we have heard really the testimony already from Joyce on that. So this is really an important work and, and really an avant-garde work. Um, also, both organizations really fully recognize that violence against women and girls is a real problem and that impunity is still the norm and that we have to fight against that. So we really very much applaud these efforts. Um, with regard to a few recommendations on what more is needed, um, first, and I, I mean, bear with me, I'm going to make five recommendations instead of three. Tailor global policies and procedures to national level and ensure, ensure that they have sufficient resources for true implementation. As we have seen ourselves as UN women, in the battle to end violence against women, while it is essential to have clear policies and procedures in place, um, starting of course in our case with global norms and standards, these must be adjusted to national and local realities and have and they need the support of government authorities um, with the political will and resources behind them in order to ensure implementation. We also need to see transparent reporting on the implementation. So implementation is really key. Second, um, take a survivor-centered approach. Protection of survivors and whistleblowers has to take top priority. Make reporting risk Free. Violence against women and girls is underreported because people too often do not feel safe to come out forward on behalf of themselves or others, and we have heard about this already today in our panel discussion. Um, powerful authorities too often get away with this and punish victims, as it was the case um, in U.S. gymnastics, for example, for, for decades, and we have all read about that in the newspaper. Third mobilize athletes as role models, as well as brands who sponsor them, and use sporting events as an opportunity to raise awareness of the issue. Let's not be silent, let's really very clearly speak out. Without addressing the underlying stereotypes that drive violence against women and girls, we won't get at the heart of the matter without this. FIFA, FIFA's um, hashtag safe home campaign is a really good example of this. Now UN Women is joining with them along with the Council of Europe and WHO. Fourthly, empower girls through increased investments in sport for gender equality, including um, on, on life skills, as we have seen in the one leads to another campaign. And finally, um, there is some movement towards the creation of an independent global entity um, to deal with violence against women and girls in sport, taking a victim or survivor-centered approach and with a goal toward ending impunity. We are hoping that this gains traction and becomes a reality in the near future. And again, we have a little bit spoken about that already today. Um, and finally, um, the recommendation is really uh, to join, as you, Chair, has also said already, the Generation Equality Campaign, the movement around generation equality. So this is where we can all be active and really make a difference next year when the forum is going to take place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dagmar for the five principal recommendations. I was expecting three, but you actually came up with five, which is excellent, okay? Thank you so much. So we move on now to Pierre Emmanuel uh, with your documentary investigation. You were able actually to explore the um, different, different facets of violence, its immediate impact on and uh, the heavy consequences it almost always has on the lives of the victims. Uh, in your opinion, what should be the prior, prior, priority actually in action to prevent violence in sport? What profound changes would you, uh, should be made actually? What are your suggestions? Yes, please, Pierre Emmanuel, <coughs> the floor is yours. Um, I think uh, I think if I could try to gather them into three three points. I think, as you said, what could be the 
what could be the the, the change, uh, the necessary change. I think that the difficulty of this topic is that, as uh, Mrs. Barbus said uh, recently, the roots are deep because it's a matter of culture, and changing a culture takes a lot of time. Still, uh, there's also an emergency of acting because of the violence that can be done on women and children. So um, I think uh, the, the, the number one, I'm going to be rather brief. I'm, my job is more to uh, raise questions than to give answers, <laughs> so far at least. So um, I think uh, a, a first aspect would be to, um, to try to implement rules um, and to try to to promote those rules and to try to make them concrete into federation. And that raises the issue of the independence of the world of sports. Uh, the independence of the world of sport has an explanation, a historical explanation, and it's extremely, that's the beauty of it. Uh, the independence of the IOC, the, indep the, the ability to gather on a field different countries, different populations, uh, is absolutely crucial and sports, to my a small point of view is extremely important to keep this distance towards the world of politics. Still, um, federations have to act. So we have, I think that is very important, and certainly the Council of Europe and many other institutions, not so many though, but there are institutions work on this, and it's extremely crucial, and, ha and the pressure has to, to, remain, uh, to remain very important in this aspect. Then I think there is also a matter of control. I don't think uh, one part of my documentary uh, treated on uh, treated off the the issue of controlling the world of sport, and I I um, uh, um, I treated this uh, this question in in France because France has a um, uh, an history of inter interventionism uh, of inter of intervening of being very present into the world of sport, and I realized that in spite of this. Uh, of this so-called culture that France was supposed to have, the level of control on, 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 on what is done or not is extremely low. And the third would be promotion. Pro promoting is, of course, very interesting, and I suggest here something that is not extremely new, but I think that we need all the help that we can, of course. We need the help of media, uh, media who are transmitting and uh, broadcasting big institution, I think it could be useful that journalists, uh, when they speak and when, uh, uh, when they introduce those competitions and those big events that gather billions of viewers in the world, they, they remind the values. So I think media could be, uh, could be involved and committed into, into promoting those values. And I think also that uh, sports industries could help us, if I dare to say us. Uh, I think they have, I mean, after the, we Too, the Me Too movement, after what we're going through with gender equality uh, wars and, and, and issues, I mean, we are in, we are going through a moment where, I mean, people are aware of the damage uh, that can be done uh, if uh, those values are not respected. And, um, and and so I think here at sport industry, we should, we, we should ask them because I think they could, it could be a moment when they could help us. And the last thing is regarding, you were, you were saying earlier, sir, um, uh, that respecting athletes is, is very important, whether they want to talk or they don't want to talk, of course. I couldn't agree more. And um, especially since sometimes they have big psychological difficulties or financial difficulties, sometimes that can happen. And so, but I think that it's not only to, to victims to talk. I think other athletes that were not victims have to talk. It's up to them. Why asking all the time to victims to talk and to, and to raise the awareness? We need the help of the stars. We need the help of, of, of the people who, who, are, who are not victims. Some of them were not. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and they need, and they need to, to raise the awareness of, of a, a, a much larger audience. That very important uh, comment and the and the, the recommendations that you've put forward. Uh, it's sad actually to hear that uh, the roots are deep, and it's difficult actually to uh, and even complicated to approach 
those roots. But um, nevertheless, we have to fight forward. We have to use the the media on this particular in this particular case. Thank you again, Pierre Manuel. <clears throat> Nadezda, uh, we are. I mean, in your opinion, uh, could international sports federations play a decisive role in preventing and actually combating violence against women in sport? Uh, what? concrete initiatives uh, can they implement? Nadezda, the floor is yours. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, never been discussing this issue, the question, so, uh, yeah. with my colleague from the board of women's sports. So, uh, uh, um, sorry, excuse me, Mrs. Kuno, we can't hear you very anyway, well. Anyway, I would be bad of shock. Uh, the European Gymnastics and uh, gymnastics is actually full of uh, women. Uh, so when I have been asked uh, 25 years ago to, um, to prepare a program for women in sport uh, committee uh, in the Czech Olympic Committee, I actually did not understand why, because for me everywhere were women and uh, everywhere uh, was this when in sport, but it was discussion how the gender is excuse, in, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Sport. No, can you hear me? So I excuse fully me. agree what Pierre just, yeah? Uh, excuse me, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. We, uh, you keep breaking up. Yeah. Is, your, is your language selector on floor? We can't hear you very well. My language floor, yes, yeah. Okay. Oh. All right, it's no? breaking up a little bit. Um, now we can't see you either. Can you hear me? Yes. Perhaps if you could, you could check in. Mm -hmm. All right, if you could continue, perhaps. Again, I try again. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay, so I don't know <laughs> where to start now. So, because uh, I don't know if you me. Talking about my work for you. Maybe better if I start uh, directly. Uh, oh? Any sign? It looks we have some problem with uh, a signal. Can you hear me? The, the, I try it, again. Can yes, you hear me? Uh, from, excuse me, Mrs. No. It it works for a while and then it breaks up again. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Is it better now? It sounds better now for the moment. Yes. I'm sorry about the signal. Maybe. Maybe it's the okay. internet signal. Maybe if you leave it without the camera. Uh, without the camera. I think that might be better for the quality of the sound. Is it? Yes. Okay, so I, I, I don't know where to start now. <laughs> Sorry. So, that's okay. Uh, I've been talking a few minutes ago about my work for the European Gymnastic Federation. And uh, that's 25 years ago, 
when uh, I have started working for the Czech Olympic Committee, um, I did not understand why we should talk more about women in sport. Because gymnastics was actually full of women. So there were, there were many talks about uh, women in sport, but not about gender issues in sport. Uh, so I tried to collect some of my ideas um, how uh, international sport federations could um, help uh, to bring concrete initiatives um, to prevent violence against women in sport. Um, I think to ensure that they have safeguarding policies in place against any form of abuse, corruption in sport, and so on. Uh, enforcing their safeguarding policies. Enforcing that all their uh, members, national sports, have safeguarding policies and procedures in place. Ensuring all members of their associations agree to the values and principles of the sport federation. Uh, engaging maybe more women in leadership within their organizations, boards, administration, coaching, whatever. Education of their board, staff, volunteers, athletes, but also sponsors on their rights and the behavior principles of their organization. Education their, their associate members, national sports on safeguarding measures and also policy development. And also designating some funds to manage the development and management of safeguarding systems. So I try to put on one list um, at least some examples how International Sports Federation can work on these issues, but not only International Sports Federations, also international sport organizations like IOC and some others. Thank you. Tradition and also for uh, uh, highlighting, we could say, the initiatives that can be uh, uh, actually implemented in uh, trying to combat violence against women. Thank you once more, despite the fact that, of course, we had problems with the connections, but I think uh, we should be okay now. So uh, now we move on to Beatrice, Beatrice Barbos. Um, Beatrice, uh, what measures uh, would you recommend to sports federations actually to combat and prevent violence against women in sport? And uh, how can we ensure the effectiveness and uh, implementation of the measures by the federations. Beatrice, the floor is yours. First of all, as the previous speaker has just said, we must in fact promote the feminization of the various bodies and the sport so that there are more women leaders more trainers, more coaches, more uh, referees. In other words, there must be more women in all positions. Needless to say, that doesn't mean that the risk will disappear, but it will reduce it uh, considerably. That's undeniable. In any event, we I think it's high time now to address these issues because, as we saw with the testimony by Sarah Bidbol, Sexism, discriminations lead to suffering, which uh, don't always involve sexual aggression, thank goodness, but nonetheless is about violence against women. And uh, this context, which I described beforehand, is dangerous. We must bear that in mind. And therefore, we need uh, to create a more welcoming, uh, calm environment. Uh, uh, so that there are more women in the sports world. 
We also need to develop prevention plans, and that's exactly what we have tried to do in the French Federation for Handball. And here I'm speaking in my capacity of Secretary General of this Federation. And now I don't know whether we'll be able to uh, watch the short uh, video, which in fact summarizes everything that's being done in terms of prevention. But first of all, I would really like to convey a very warm thanks to uh, the sociologist and the uh, leader and the woman who is Sarah Bidball for her testimony because indeed I can attest to the fact that as from when her book uh, comes out and that her uh, statement is heard, people started become aware, becoming aware of this issue in France, at least within the federations. And therefore, I would like to also express a big thank you to all the journalists who denounced in 2019 and 2020 all the violence being committed and perpetrated against uh, women and minors. And I believe that they need to be thanked because, uh, alas, this is what makes things move forwards. And it's a shame because we shouldn't have to denounce such things through the media for us to become aware of these issues and to come to grips with these issues. But that's reality. So thanks to both of you, and please continue. And I would like to say to all federations, no matter what their nationalities may be, no matter where they are, do not waste time. Do not wait. We've waited long enough. And be careful because now the media will in fact uh, remind you quite openly what your institution really represents. And therefore, I believe that all federations should be encouraged to deal with this. Now, as regards the Handball Federation, we've been working on this for the past two years. And I can confirm to you that uh, fortunately, when we set up the working group to combat all forms of violence, sexual, racist, sexism, homophobia, etc., so to combat all forms of violence, we realized that there has to be, and I'm in fact speaking, uh, voicing the words of my own president when he presented this plan to the press last October. He said, thank you uh, to you ladies who are shaking things up in the sports world. And I hope that this can be translated properly into English. He called us the ones who shake things up in professional terms, the professional shakers. There have to be women who fight for this in each sports institution. And fortunately, sometimes they are assisted by men, as was the case with our own uh, president and other men in my own federation, who really became aware of the issues, quite simply because at the outset, we had set up a unit uh, to make reports, to um, relay testimonies, etc., and by studying the cases, because people, in fact, are in these cases, they realized to what extent this is widespread. And that's the way we were able to continue our work, and we will be able to draw up this plan. So I don't know whether we have time to watch the short video right now. It would, in fact, be more lively. It would enable us to summarize what I'm trying to say. Is it possible? I apologize. Mrs. Uh, Barbus, but there's a potential problem of overloading the system if we do that. But we can make it available if you wish, if you just uh, send it to us. Very well, I'll try to summarize. So there are five main pillars in our plan. First and foremost, uh, Sarah earlier on spoke about the honor, the honorability of the leaders of uh, uh, the managers. And uh, as from January 2021, all the managers, all all those who are in charge of children will have to provide some kind of certificate to prove their honorability. Or they have to declare that they have committed re reprehensible acts in the past into alias sexual acts. They have to admit that. Secondly, we have to assist the victims and their families because, of course, the families are also affected and all witnesses. Of course, that is not at the heart of the work of sports organizations, and that's why we have had to set up partnerships inter alia with the organization France Victime for that. And in, a, in that 
that means that we have been able uh, to um, somehow provide social, legal, and psychological assistance. Furthermore, in this context, we've set up a unit for internal, uh, an internal reporting system. A third pillar in this plan, heightening awareness and encouraging people to speak out. And there, we uh, turn to an association which is called uh, uh, Colosse au pied d'argile. There are other similar organizations to encourage people to speak out. So Colosse au pied uh, d'argile, thanks to its founder, who is also a survivor, is going to intervene in the field, in the clubs, in the departmental committees, in the training schools, etc., in order to intervene and make people speak out. And each time it intervenes, at least two children speak up after having heard what this, this organization has to say to them. Fourthly, obviously, we need to train all the key players who intervene in the world of sport. To that end, we've, uh, in fact, uh, nominated, appointed territorial agents who will be trained themselves in order, in turn, to train uh, integrity managers in each uh, part of the French territory. And lastly, needless to say, we need to communicate properly. We have to have communication tools for all these structures. We have developed posters, a video clip, a communication toolbox with an educational uh, uh, tool. So this is a plan which will, in fact, cover the next four years. This will, of course, require Funding. We need to find financial means and uh, human resources. This will cost at least 100,000 euros. So how can we ensure its effectiveness? That's part of the questions you put to me. How can we ensure the effectiveness of what is being implemented? Well, first and foremost, well, first and foremost we need proper political will in each sports organization for these plans to be efficient. There has to be real will. And we also need to have measures to evaluate what is being done. Lastly, we have to make people accountable. Make it compulsory. Make such a plan compulsory in France. In fact, there is the uh, possibility via the Ministry for Sport uh, to impose the implementation of such a plan in all sports federations. And this could be done by all European and international federations, by all national Olympic committees as well. Now, of course, I know that we don't like to be compelled to do things, to make things mandatory. But to take up uh, what was said by a French philosopher, there will not be any equality without constraint. And if we really wish to fight, if we really wish to work on these issues, we absolutely have to urge everyone to adopt prevention plans, but proper prevention plans. We could, of course, we could also imagine adopting certain standards as we do with the ISO standards regarding quality and economic uh, sectors. This could be managed by an independent body on the basis of objective criteria. And this would be a real asset in terms of competitiveness, including for federations once they have obtained this label or this standard. So in short, as you can see, there's still, there, there remains a great deal to do and what you're doing as well. I believe that this, in fact, uh, contributes to the progress being made. It enables us to share observations, diagnoses, uh, testimonies, but best practices as well. So quite simply, I would like to thank you to finish because organizing, increasing the number of such webinars and roundtable discussions and conferences can only help us to make headway. And once again, my thanks to Sarah. Sarah, if you could really imagine to what extent your book has enabled certain people to speak out. Thank you. Thank you once again. Microphone, please. Microphone. Thank you. The highlight, uh, or rather the highlighting the ways to ensure 
the effectiveness and uh, impl and implementation of the measures uh, by the federations in combating uh, violence against uh, women, especially here in sport. Uh, now we'll move again to Joyce Cook. Uh, we say that in 2018, the Council of Europe and uh, FIFA signed uh, a memorandum of understanding framing their cooperation. Uh, it states that uh, within this cooperation, the particular efforts will be actually merged with uh, regard to combating violence against women and uh, promoting gender equality, including by further developing a gender-sensitive approach in policies and measures and uh, uh, countering gender stereotypes and uh, social cultural barriers. This is an excellent illustration of uh, partnership that will no doubt enhance implementation of the Council of Europe standards. Um, how can we make preventing and combating violence against women in sport a priority for sports federations at uh, national and international level? So, uh, Joyce, uh, the floor is yours again, please. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you very much for the further opportunity and uh, um, in particular to, to, to highlight um, you know, in the first part of the session talking about the real importance of safeguarding and preventative measures and not underestimating those and the reality that every single person that is involved in sports, be they employed, be they a coach, whoever they are, a volunteer, um, needs to be mindful and that, uh, you know, comments that we've heard is it's common sense. Well, some of it may be common sense, but not all. But there is, cert you know, certainly a framework of well-developed preventative measures that can be established to avoid opportunities for those that uh, would choose to uh, perpetuate violence, uh, harassment or, or any form of abuse towards young people girls, boys, women and any vulnerable adult and of course that matters across every aspect of, of, this, of our sports but also in our competition modes and, and our event safeguarding which is another area we're working very intensely on. Um, we did a pilot study in France at the Women's World Cup last year and we will be rolling this out um, with the priority to our youth and women's competitions, our, our, our FIFA World Cups but also providing training to our member associations for their own competitions and events so that they are very clear as well because what we have understood from the experts and the evidence is this is often where um, in particular players are most vulnerable and, and, and women and children are most vulnerable. With all that in mind, you know, I think what really resonates and, and, and coming back to Sarah and her powerful testimony today and uh, um, in, in all that she's doing to raise the awareness amongst other survivors in sports is you know what really resonates is educating children that children understand what they can say no to what is not appropriate and I think as well as parents that falls very much on the responsibility of sports too and, and something we hear loud and clear in the work that we are now looking at and rolling out but being mindful, of course, that whenever we speak about these subjects, it is often a, a moment when someone may choose to disclose and ensuring that persons that are properly qualified to support a victim or survivor in those cases. We really welcome investigative journalism. Indeed, it's part of our human rights code to defend um, journalists and, that report uh, violations of human rights. That said, you know, I, I'd like to talk, if I may, a little bit about our experience in dealing with abuse cases and reports um, in football. Um, I've said previously we were late to the table. We have had a number of very well documented in the media high profile cases. We banned uh, the, the main per perpetrator for life in Afghanistan for his crimes um, uh, towards uh, women in Afghanistan football. Um, we, sadly, he is still at large in Afghanistan and uh, um, is a very powerful person. There have been several attempts to arrest him. And I think this really leads into some of the challenges that we are finding, um, of course, as a very uh, well resourced um, uh, sports governing body and in the work that we are doing and the determination we have. We have a jurisdiction over. 
um, our 211 members in regards to anyone that's defined as a football official where a case that is reported is not properly um, investigated and managed. We also have a jurisdiction where the responsible uh, member association or confederation asks us to take the case on their behalf and what we have found is that actually that is indeed happening that they're asking us to take the cases. We've had um, a, a, a real learning from uh, the Afghanistan case and we understand very well the importance of a survivor-centered approach from the get-go and we have become very clear and indeed in the the ongoing case in Haiti that is an absolute first base priority we appointed um, absolute experts as the investigating team on the ground in 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 uh, such cases in the wider context not sports uh, trained psychologists and trained human rights lawyers I think it's really important here to look in the wider context and you know in, in our first round of discussions I mentioned very firmly the responsibility of all of us. In no way do we stand back from our responsibility. And at FIFA, you know, as I said, we take our responsibility extremely seriously. Um, our president leads us in this work. He has made a very firm commitment to this area. But what we've understood is, is as I said, we can't do this alone. Investigating a case that with the greatest respect is played out through the media, where we have limited evidence where we can't turn to local law enforcement and the statutory agencies such as child protection, it makes it very difficult for a sport to investigate and do their job well without risking the safety of victims, survivors and whistleblowers. Indeed, we have found that to be very much the case in recent uh, cases. We are also clear that we are not the only sport that is experiencing that. We have, have spoken to a, a lot of different sports now on this very topic. Um, we, I would say, you know, with the huge and utmost respect and applauding investigative journalism, it has brought this and other topics to the fore, and it's important that continues. But I would plead every journalist, every NGO, and I come from the NGO sector before joining FIFA, so I recognize and respect hugely the work that NGOs do, to sports that we always ensure that the, the psychological and counselling support is provided for anybody brave enough to provide testimony, whether it be for a media article, for an NGO to report um, on, on, a, on a case in sports or any other sector, or indeed sports themselves. And that's so fundamentally important as the first base. With all of this in mind, and being mindful that we're talking about countries in some cases where legislation exists, where a framework for statutory agency exists, but they are not working. And we have to recognize that, all of us, and what we can do together. So after a lot of internal discussion with my counterparts in our ethics investigation team, um, with uh, the president himself, we began to understand that perhaps this was a moment to create a new entity, not to remove the obligation of each sport that has to remain, but to help us to properly investigate these cases. We, as I said, have spoken to a range of sports. We're speaking to the IOC. Our president announced in the signing of our memorandum of understanding with UNODC quite recently that we are calling for a new entity and we will be launching a consultation process. We very much want to do that together with all sports. We've been honestly um, inspired by all of the sports we've spoken to, have recognized a willingness and an absolute determination to address these cases of abuse, as well as looking to the preventative measures. But indeed, not every sport has all of the, the resources, and none of us have the full competencies I hope I've just alluded and touched on now. We've had very exciting discussions with Interpol. We've had three serious meetings with them about the role that they could play in such an entity. But what we're calling for is a multi-sport, multi-government, and multi-agency entity. It would most likely be governments and sports that would come together, not unlike WADA, but what we're not intending to do is to create an entity that's overbearing, overwielding, doomed to fail. We want to start with an entity that has a very finite mandate, and these are the reasons why. 
What we've understood from all of the experts is that when somebody wants to report a case of abuse, they most likely will not go to the entity where it is happening as their first port of call. Of course, these are crimes. They may not go as their first port of call to the criminal authorities. It may be, as I just mentioned, that they are not yet fully able to cope with these, these cases or indeed trustworthy. We also have to face the fact that in some cases in sports, the perpetrators have influence um, in, in the wider society as well as within their own sport. So what we would like to create is an entity that provides for anybody to be able to, in a much more neutral, trusted environment, a much more accessible environment, be able to pick up the phone and maybe in that first call, all they say is, I need to talk to you about something. And immediately a counsellor, a psychologist is on hand that speaks their own language, that speaks in a cultural significance and resonance for them, that understands all of the complexities wrapped up in abuse in sports and more widely, poverty, aspirations. You know, we talk about the values of sports and well-being in sports and, and the well-being bringing it brings, but then day to day in every sport, we repeat what has been um, given as testimony today in expecting that a young person is always aspiring and pushing beyond their boundaries. And we need to think in all of these elements. But coming back to the entity, we want a place that people can go to in a trusted way. And when they're ready to say, yes, please pass this to the um, required sport. We would like to start with the international sports governing bodies. That's who we have been speaking to. And there is a broad agreement. Some have already tried to mobilize like us experts on the ground but we can't and shouldn't and won't wait to investigate cases of abuse when there is a sufficient capacity and framework statutory agency framework within the country to investigate that case we have a moral ethical obligation um, to, to, to investigate at the moment it's reported so we also see this entity working in a number of other ways we would also propose that there would be two possibilities. One, that a sport such as football, as FIFA, could rely on a pool of trusted local experts. We don't want people flying all across the world to tell another country or to investigate in another country um, these very sensitive um, allegations and reports of abuse. We want persons on the ground with the right expertise to investigate these cases in the right way in a survivor-centered approach. It can be that that file or, or that the resources that we have a pool of experts readily on hand for we can re react promptly when the allegation is made. It may be that for some sports, for sports, sports with less resources, particularly in the international context, that that sport would instruct the entity to undertake the investigation on their behalf with the experts at hand. But in any case, we believe the file should either be passed back or the investigation undertaken by the sport itself. It's the responsibility of all sports to eradicate anybody that, that wants to continue to abuse, harass children, boys, girls, women, any vulnerable adult in sports. We don't want them in sports. And I think this is something that sports want to say out loud. Certainly at FIFA, we do. We are really obliged and committed to this topic. We mean what we say. In addition, what I would say and what we propose is that this entity would provide other opportunities. We're all very interested, each sports we've spoken to, and it's the international governing bodies, we're all very interested in finding a due diligence process that stops perpetrators jumping from one region to another or indeed one sport to another. And in that regard, we again have had some very exciting discussions with Interpol and the pilot program they're trialing with Save the Children in the UK for appointing persons around the world. And lastly, we would see this as potentially a knowledge hub. Not all sports, I think um, earlier one of the panelists mentioned, not all sports have the resources to roll out robust safeguarding programs. If that's the case, this could act as a knowledge hub in that regard as well. So we are calling for this entity. We will be launching the consultation very soon. We're having pre-consultation discussions at the moment. And we genuinely think that for all sports, for all governments, for all of us, 
but mostly for the victims, the survivors, and the whistleblowers, this is much needed. So we're going to explore that <clears throat> in great detail, and we hope to call a working group early next year with the determination, we don't take three years to set this up, that we set this up very, very promptly, because there is an absolute need, and every sport that is serious about eradicating abuse from its sport has to understand, if they don't already, and we believe many do, that we have to roll our sleeves up now and all work together to make this a reality. We shouldn't have to rely on victims to provide their testimonies in a painful way. We're very thankful and very grateful those brave enough to come forward, but we have to give them a safe space to report, not to have to do it in the public domain. So I hope that um, gives a broad overview of what we're trying to achieve. We're absolutely determined and uh, we will give it our best shot. And as I say, just to close, we've been very um, positively inspired by the reaction from other sports, by the reaction from the UN agencies that we've been speaking with, Interpol and, and, and other entities that are experts in this field. And governments as well, I should say, because our president is very busy speaking to heads of states and getting very positive responses from governments as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joyce, all right, for giving us that broad overview of how to uh, prevent and combat violence against women in sport. Um, I would like to remind our members of the committee as well as all the participants, of course, uh, the panelists as well, you have to bear with us. We have time up to 12.30 instead of 12 as it was indicated earlier. So um, I hope it won't disturb most of your program in uh, the next 30 minutes. So um, now I would like to thank you all uh, panelists for the information provided and of course uh, elements to help us with uh, our actions. Uh, now uh, I would like to open the flow to our members who are on KUDO. Uh, we are, <clears throat> as I said, we are running a, a webinar until 12.30. Uh, who would like to ask a question to one of our panelists? Please request uh, the floor and uh, do not forget to introduce yourselves, please, okay? Do we have anybody at the moment? <clears throat> Yes, Monsieur Conseil National, Jean-Pierre Green. Oui, bonjour. Yes, can you hear me? Good morning. Oui, Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre Green from Switzerland. I am at uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. I would like to uh, greet you all and thank all of the panelists. Thank you very much for all your presentations. They're extremely complete. I believe there are three types of violence. There's not only sexual and sexist violence, there's also the psychological violence because highly competitive sport means you need to uh, train very intensively and that means also a lot of sacrifice. In my own country, quite a few young women have complained of the iron hand discipline which was imposed upon them by their coach. They can't gain weight. There's abuse of power on their body uh, which means that they lose part of their own identity or personality. And as Mrs. Schumacher and Mrs. Barbu said, sports should also have female coaches. Women should be coaches because then there's a, a feminine touch to the way they interact with uh, women. I would like to ask uh, how it was possible for Saha to actually stand that. Jean, uh, we going to have, uh, 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 we'll have to see the answers. Probably, probably we'll let's try and see if we can gather more questions before we have the answers, okay? We have Konur. Uh, uh, ready to ask a question. Connell, the floor is yours. Yes, Connell, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Bonu Nuroleva. Nuroleva, your floor is yours, please. We can see you, but we can't hear you, Mrs. Nuroleva. No. Can you unmute your mic? No, okay. So, uh, probably in the second round. Okay, let's have the, some answers. Okay, who will be first? We have, uh, who will be first in answering? Maybe Madame Beatrice? Yes, please. The floor is yours. Can you answer the question from? Moi-même, Sarah Vidbol ou Madame Barbus, pardon. Should I take the floor, or did you want um, Beatrice Barbus to take the floor? Sarah is going to speak. Yes, Sarah, please. The floor is yours. Oui, donc pour. Uh... I would like to answer the member of the Parliamentary Assembly who mentioned the psychological violence. Yes, I also un underwent that. I wasn't allowed to take a gram. I was weighed every day. And if we gained weight, we were yelled at by the coach. And he said, you've got to eat less. You've got to gain, you've got to reach the right weight. There are other types of psychological violence. Many coaches, I believe. Don't notice that. We need more women coaches. It should be women coaches who train women because of their sensitivity to this type of issue. And also they have that experience of high level sports person, as is my case, for instance, and uh, couple skating. I have my own experience. I can share that, the physical experience, but also the psychological experience. So there's a lot I can talk about to athletes. For instance, if uh, an athlete gains weight, I could explain that you can become a high-level athlete and put all the chances on your side and do your best by paying attention to your weight. Thank you very much. Uh, who else would like to contribute to answer the question of our colleague from Switzerland? Yes, Madame Beatrice. Barbus, yes, please. You have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, I mentioned that uh, at the outset. We notice that there's uh, ill treatment, actually. That's what it should be called in sports. Uh, psychic pressure, the way the athletes are spoken to when they're trained. But now people are speaking out. We're only at the very beginning. A week ago, in uh, judo, for instance, some athletes spoke out of real violence in the way they were trained. And they're described also in Sarah Abed Ball's book. Ill treatment exists. It's nothing new because 30 years ago, I remember when I was playing handball, we weren't treated right, psychologically ill treated. But at least today, there's a beginning of uh, uh, telling about it, whistleblowing. And in order to combat that phenomenon, there should be more women in the top jobs, but you can't say that the problem can be solved only by putting women in men's jobs. They aren't 100% virtuous either. Perhaps they're more open to the way a woman functions than a man, depending on the way you're educated, actually. It's not because you're a woman or because you're a man. It's not by nature that women are nicer than men or less violent. I don't believe that. I think it has to do with uh, education, with uh, the way we're socialized, with our upbringing, basically. So 
having women will diminish the risk of some of these forms of violence, but it will not be enough. What we also have to change is the way young people are trained, the way athletes are trained. Until the last few decades in the field of sports, and I actually wrote it in my thesis 30 years ago, the way uh, we've been managed is terribly autocratic, whereas today there's a beginning of questioning that. So it's studies on the way young people are trained that are needed with more participation, with more uh, engagement from the young people. Uh, yelling isn't the best method. The former methods weren't the best. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Merci. Uh, Pierre, uh, Emmanuel, you also want to top up to the answers that has been given so far. Please, the floor is yours. Am I there? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just very fastly, uh, I, I think that the, 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 what, what appears here is that <clears throat> sexual violence is one of the branches of a tree of global violence toward the athletes. Mm -hmm. And I think if we want to be really serious and to, to tackle, tackle this issue, we have to consider revisiting the way, as just Madame Barbu said, uh, the way to address athletes and to address the whole process. This is another reason why it's so complicated, to address the whole process of, of coaching as well. Uh, and uh, yes, the same tree, that, and this, and another branch is the uh, emotional uh, violence. Another branch is the physical violence. And sometimes it goes together. Sometimes you have only one branch and not the other. But the very root is, to me, um, a new way of considering the athlete. This is to me, what is, if I have only one thing to say here today, is that it's the, 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 the role of the athlete that, is, that, that has to become central again. They, we, we all believe and maybe the audience believe that the athlete is at the top of the pyramid, not today. The athlete at the very bottom. The, as, as some of the, the athletes told me, sometimes they feel like cannon fodder. It's very violent. I heard that many times in different mouths in different countries. I think athletes has to come back at the top of the pyramid and because sport is for them. They sacrifice their life. They sacrifice their time. They sacrifice so much for, 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 for what we watch, for what we can, we can see on our, on our screens. And we, we, they deserve to be respected more. And they, they deserve a, can I say revolution? <laughs> Maybe the word is a little too strong, but they deserve another way of being treated globally. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, so we have uh, uh, one more question from the committee members. Uh, we have Konur Nurul Laeva. You have the flow. Nurul you have the flow. Yes, please. Konul, the floor is yours. Unfortunately, we mm, still can't hear you. It seems as if we have a technical problem with, uh, with your microphone mm, is whatever. not working for some reason. So we will then. Uh, uh, probably have, move on to if you have a question, the questions you that could put uh, it in the messaging. Uh, some participants have, uh, have actually uh, posted uh, via the Facebook. I have uh, actually two questions that uh, just came in. Uh, one is actually to Madame Beatrice Barbus. Uh, uh, an important uh, raise the the issue that uh, sports federations are closed and change will not only come by changing the structure and uh, uh, installing reporting system uh, how can this be achieved how can we achieve this 
This is a question that was raised to Madame Beatrice Barbos. Yes, please, the floor is yours, ma'am. How to set up a reporting system? Well, there are two ways. Either it's imposed upon the Federation from the outside and they have to be accountable. A ministry can require that or a European organization or international organization or it's an internal request as I mentioned earlier when I took the floor. In that case, in-house, you do what's necessary and that's what we're do doing. We have uh, in our board 51% women 45% in the executive of the Federation and I can say that we really weighed, we really pressured so that this be implemented and be measurable and personally every month I ask uh, for figures how many cases were there since January where the system was put up we do have one case a week that uh, comes up to our level in the French Handball Federation so we have to ask others to be accountable when you're at the head you have to ask for account so it is fundamental that women be also at these top places all equality gender equality programs are also helpful in combating violence and I'd like to say that violence isn't only against uh, the athletes themselves but also uh, against the people members of the board or others it's just like a company women are a minority they're isolated which means that they are the object sometimes of physical violence, sometimes of more symbolic violence. Uh, at the top places, sexual violence isn't in the first place, but there is pressure. Therefore, equality is fundamental. Equality in sport is part of that. Since 2017, f federations are not forced to have in what we call feminization plans. At least having more women at the top levels is helpful. I hope I answered the question. Okay. Uh, the second question from our participants uh, uh, is from Anne Trivas, the chair uh, of the CEF Sport International. All right. She's saying that I'm unable to ask a question through the uh, webinar link, but I wanted to raise the question of responsible journalism. Uh, whilst there are many responsible journalists, Many are predominantly after a story and advance, advancing their own career, careers and profiles. How can athletes uh, maintain control of their very personal experiences in the media? That's the question Anne Trivers has asked. All right. Can we have uh, anybody to respond to this important question? Joyce, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And, and a shout out to Anne um, Tivis and the work she's done over many years at the NSPCC in the UK and now in setting up Safe Sports International. And, uh, you know, Anne, you, you've raised a really important question. And I think it's one it's important that we honestly address together. You know, I think, as I said earlier, all of us respect and understand the important role that investigative journalism plays in all elements of our life, including in violence and abuse in sports. Nevertheless, and we have had first-hand experience of this at FIFA in a recent case, and I, I'm going to be careful what I say so I don't uh, risk um, uh, more personal evidence and ongoing cases, but we um, have, you know, understandably been high profile in, in the media as FIFA and indeed, you know, we don't shy away from media reports in, in, in these cases and indeed for bringing them to our attention if that is sadly where we're at at the moment that it is the first and only way and hence the entity we're calling for. But more recently there was a second storyline that was published on a case we were told that the media was going to advise new alleged perpetrators. We had no evidence of perpetrators. And we were very mindful of what was happening on the ground in a very volatile um, situation. We were aware that some victims and survivors and whistleblowers had received very serious death threats. And I personally, uh, with the permission of FIFA FIFA Ethics, spoke to the investigators involved, uh, the, the media involved, 
and I asked if they would just be mindful that they don't put at risk any um, survivors victims by their storyline and again urged that they would please share with us the testimonies or at least contact so that we could investigate the cases properly and what happened was they published the story in any case and two two days three days later on a Sunday afternoon I got a very urgent phone call from one of the journalists pleading for help and I couldn't even understand what he was saying at first and anyway the, 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 the what had happened was that one of the newly alleged perpetrators by the, by, the, by the journalists had taken the story and circulated around the relevant um, constituents, uh, those involved in the sector in, in football he is working in or was working in and asked that they sign a petition effectively that he's a fine upholding member of the society and football. And one woman had refused to sign the petition and she had therefore received a death threat to be executed the following morning. We were sent by the journalist two, video, uh, two voicemail recordings which we immediately put, passed to our trained psychologists and human rights lawyers on the ground in the country concerned. They advised us these were extremely serious threats. We couldn't turn to the criminal statutory agencies for help and indeed we relied on our trusted sources locally to take that woman who indeed has a small baby and her husband into safe refuge and we are now supporting them in temporary safe refuge along with a number of other survivors and victims. So this is where all of us have to, in, the, in what we're all trying to achieve together, which is hugely important, that we are mindful in every step of the way about the survivor-centered approach. And nobody, not me, not you, not a journalist, unless you are an experienced, trained counselor or psychologist in these very specific cases, should be taking testimonies directly from survivors or victims. We are not qualified to note and to respond to whatever trauma that may bring and what we understand is it doesn't matter what stage you're at in your survivor journey these are always painful difficult testimonies to recount and they have an impact on everybody that that, that te gives that testimony and we have to keep that at center stage in everything we're all trying to achieve and we're all on the same side here so let's be mindful in that respect and thank you Anne for raising that because it's an incredibly important point for media for sports for all of us thank you to learn what on after raised um, I personally and the secretariat would like to thank you for participating in this webinar uh, taking the time for being with us and uh, for your inspiration inspiring we could say contributions uh, especially uh, to all the panelists <coughs> Uh, we are 20 minutes after the hour and uh, I don't know whether we still have any other questions before I can be able to uh, finally say the, the final words. Are there any other questions that we can check? Yes, Sarah, they wanted to say something, please. <clears throat> the floor is yours. Yes, I would like to thank all those who took the floor, thank you for your kind words. I'm saying it because it's still hard for me. There are times where I'm uh, up, there are times where I'm down, very down, where are times where I have doubts because of what I've gone through. So every kind word you've said to me gives me the strength to continue fighting today. So I did want to say thank you to each and every one. Thank you for your words. They make me strong. Thank you, Missy, Missy. <clears throat> yes, any other contributions we have? Do we have any contributions, any further contributions? Yes, Joyce. <clears throat> Joyce, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yes, Joyce, the floor is yours. Yes, please. Yes, please, Joyce. The floor is yours.
Joyce, the floor is yours. Thank you. I was just waiting for the release. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, very humbly after Sarah, you know, we, we, we must never forget the brave women and, and men and, uh, that come forward. And, uh, you know, all of us are humbled, Sarah, by your testimony and the testimony of other survivors. And uh, I guess from, from me, from FIFA, what we say and what we're doing at the moment is let's keep speaking together. We're going to fix this together. Um, and our experience is that certainly at the international dimension there is a real determination and uh, we've seen the US set up a, a safe sport entity, we've seen discussions uh, where we're based in Switzerland most recently in the in last days of setting up a similar entity for sports in Switzerland, but we also need to look at this in an international dimension. So please let's all keep speaking together. We can all keep learning from each other in our different dimensions and perspectives, and uh, we, will, we will solve this together, but it's going to take absolute commitment from all of us and probably for years to come, and, and we must never take our eye off the ball because uh, sadly it's a reality of our societies that people exist that want to abuse. And I'd just like to make one last comment that, you know, sadly our, our, our experience has been, although it's much less common, that women also can create and, and commit abuse, harassment, and the pressures. It isn't only the men, and we're going to fix this together as men and women. It isn't the responsibility of only the women or only the men. We would do it together. And uh, thank you from, from, from FIFA for this opportunity today and big applaud to the Council of Europe and PACE for setting the platform to discuss such important elements and topics. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Yes, Pierre-Emmanuel, you have the floor. <clears throat> Yeah, very fast. I just want to uh, to congratulate again all the victims uh, that uh, that dare to to go public with their story, and all the ones that that did my documentary, of course. And it was a, a great, uh, it was crucial. And again, congratulations to Sarah. I just wanted to, to 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 say thanks and to say that I'm not sure that it did help their career or not, but I want to thank the people from the Indianapolis Star who released the story, the Nassar case the people from The Guardian, who released the Woodward story, and Emmanuel Anison, who helped Sarah to, to go public. So I wanted to thank them too. Right, thank you. Uh, well, before I can give the floor to Dagmar, uh, we still have one more question from the Facebook uh, page uh, from Teresa in Ghana, who is asking about what is the most effective measure to increase the number of women athletes in general? What is the most effective measure to increase the number of uh, women athletes? Yes, uh, probably Dagmar can answer the question in the, in the process as well. All right, Dagmar, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Um, maybe I'll leave the question um, to some of the sports association. Um, what I wanted to say is, um, first of all, thank you for, for this really, really important dialogue um, that, of course, needs to be continued, as many of us said today. I just want to um, mention again the Generation Equality Forum. Um, part of the Generation Equality Forum and the actions is, is something that we call six action coalitions. There's one action coalition on um, combating gender based violence. Um, we have a number of leads already for the action coalitions and I just want to um, invite everybody to, to become active in these action coalitions. There's always interest to have more members and I think particularly also for sports associations this could be really relevant. So this is an open invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Madam Beatrice, you can answer the question of, our, of Madam Teresa in Ghana. Yes, please. The floor is yours. The truth. Yes, so to answer the Facebook question, I think we need a whole debate to answer that question. So I can't answer in a couple of seconds. How can we ensure that there are more women athletes, more women in sports? I think uh, it's more than a couple of seconds we need. but. I would like in turn to express my thanks and once again tell Sarah what she's done is crucial. 
I've seen it inside my federation. I've seen it in French sports. Being a witness is essential. When you free your soul by speaking out, when major athletes such as Sarah speak out, then things go forward. That's generally what makes the world better. So thank you, and thank you for organizing, and thank you for inviting us. And it's all together, women and men, that we will be able together, side by side, to make uh, this uh, sports culture less violent than it is today everywhere around the world. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, just to wind up, because we are running out of time, I would like to Thank you again, especially the panelists, for participating in the webinar and uh, for taking the time for being with us and for your inspiring contributions that you have put forward. Allow me to express my gratitude to my fellow parliamentarians who are members of the network, as well as the Committee on Equality of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe for your participation in the extraordinary and inspiring webinar. My appreciation also goes to all the other participants who took part. You've made the event a success. Uh, the recording of the webinar will be available on the YouTube channel of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and uh, I will definitely and beyond doubt refer to it in uh, my upcoming report. I would also like to thank the interpreters for the great job that they have done. I look forward to continuing our discussion through various channels. And uh, thank you so much once more. I wish you all good health in this unpleasant period of, for mankind. And of course, a wonderful day and week to all of you. Thank you so much for being with us. <clears throat>